أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما غلا وللآخرة خير لك من الأولى ولسوف يعطيك ربك فترضى فلم يجدك يتيما فآوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فحدث صدق الله العظيم. Respected President, Honored Chief Guest, Ladies and Gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to extend on behalf to extend on behalf of the President. Secretary and Management of the Muslim Educational Association of Southern India and on my own behalf a cordial welcome to the honored chief guest of this evening Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Nayak, President Islamic Research Foundation Mumbai who has been kind enough in accepting our invitation and coming here to participate in Sirat Nabi function. I take this opportunity to welcome you all and the esteemed guest of this evening. On this auspicious and happy occasion, I feel elevated to introduce the chief guest, Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Nayak. From a doctor by profession, training, uh, professional training, graduating from TN Medical College, Nair Hospital, Bombay, with an MBBS, Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Nayak has turned around in earnest to make Dawa the propagation of Islam in the right perspective, his primary mission and in life. He is acclaimed and introduced at the gathering and public meeting. He is invited to speak at, as a pragmatic person with a sharp analytical bent of mind, an individual with an in-depth practical perception of the subject. He deals with a dynamic die of Islam. Being a habitual stammer since childhood, notably Dr. Zakir has had a breakthrough since three, year in, three years into delivering talks to alternative audience on Islam, reinforced by his foolproof facts and studies on Islam as well as comparative religion. His admirers appear, appreciate him for his broad understanding of contemporary human affairs and motivations. Dr. Zakir has had opportunities of further broadening his understanding of religious, cultural and traditional approaches and influence on life and people worldwide through his visits and dawa tours to US, Britain, France, Germany, South Africa, Switzerland, Singapore, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia and many other countries. Recently, he visited the countries and he had 60, 60 lectures during his tour. But he personally brushes aside each, brushes aside such acknowledgement and insists that he is merely a humble servant of Allah and a keen student of Islam and as well as comparative religion. With the Holy Quran and Islamic way of life as his perfect base, fully reinforced by his dynamic data and analysis on the, on, the, on the complete compatibility of Islam with logic, reason and science. Dr. Zakir speaks with renewed righteousness and infallibility of Islamic teachings. He is the Secretary General of Islamic Research Foundation and Chairman of the Islamic Research Foundation Education Trust. May I request the Dr. 
اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان محمد ابا احد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين وكان الله بكل شيء عليما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي the respected people on the dais the chairperson janab haji mohammad hashim saheb the prince of our court the chairman of sit college the honorary secretary the respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters i welcome all of you with islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace blessings and mercy of all my dear allah be on all of you the topic of this evening's talk is prophet muhammad peace be upon him sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the various religious scriptures of the world many people have the misconception that prophet muhammad peace be upon him is the founder of the religion of islam in fact Islam is there since time immemorial. It's there since man set foot on the earth. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Fatir, chapter number thirty-five, verse number twenty-four, it says, "Wa imin ummatin illa halafiha nazir." There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warning or a guide. The Quran says in Surah Rad, chapter number thirteen. Verse number seven. While he called the calm in hard, and to every nation we have sent a warner. My name, the Holy Quran mentions twenty-five messengers by name. For example, Adam, Moses, Jesus, Solomon, Muhammad. Peace be upon them all. But according to the tradition of a beloved prophet. There were more than 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 164, as well as in Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 78, that we relate to you the stories of some of the messengers, of the others we don't. That means some messengers of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala have been mentioned in the Holy Quran. The others have not been mentioned. All the messengers of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala of God Almighty <clears throat> that came before Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, they were only meant for a particular group of people. They were only sent for a particular group of people, and the message which they brought was only meant for a particular time period. It was not till eternity. The Holy Quran says. <clears throat> That Musa alayhi salam, Moses peace be upon him, he was only sent for the Bani Israel, for the children of Israel. The Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number forty-nine, that Jesus peace be upon him was sent as a messenger to the Bani Israel, to the children of Israel. He was only sent for the Jews. A, a similar message is given in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number ten. Verse number five to six, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, tells his disciples, his apostles, that go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews. Go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, and enter ye not into the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the house of the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number fifteen. Verse number twenty-four: That I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was only sent for the Jews. But the Holy Quran says, and I start my talk by quoting a verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Azab, chapter number thirty-three, verse number forty, which says, "Ma kana Muhammadun, ma kana Muhammadun Aba Ahdim min Rajalikum." ولكن رسول الله وقادم النبيين وكان الله بكل شيء عليما. That Muhammad peace be upon him is not the father of any of you men, but is the messenger of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and is Khatmun Nabiin is the seal of the prophets. 
and Allah is all knowing, full of knowledge. The Holy Quran says that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last of the prophets and messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says in Surah Al Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, it says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to the whole of humankind. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was not sent only to the Muslims or the Arabs, he was sent to the whole of humankind. The Quran says in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, it says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَظِيرًا That we have sent thee as a universal messenger giving glad tidings to men and warning them against sin but the most of them ye do not understand Since the Holy Quran says that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was sent for the whole of humankind all the Muslims, Alhamdulillah, will agree with it. But since a non-Muslim does not believe that the Holy Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will not agree that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a last and final prophet of God Almighty and is sent for the whole of humankind. So to make them realize this, we have to take the help of the Holy Quran, which says in Surah Al-Imran, Chapter number three, verse number 64, which says that Ta'ala will in that come to common terms as between us and you. So since the non-Muslims will not believe in the Holy Quran, we have to prove to them about the advent of a beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from their holy scriptures. So let's analyze today. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the various religious scriptures of the world. Let's first discuss the prophecy of a beloved prophet in the Hindu scriptures. Amongst the Hindu scriptures, the most sacred are the Vedas. There are principally four Vedas. The Rig Ved, the Ajur Ved, the Sam Ved and the Atharva Ved. The first three, the Rig Ved, the Ajur Ved, the Sam Ved are known as the Triple Vidya, the Triple Sciences. And they were revealed much earlier as compared to the last Ved, that is Atharva Ved. The Rig Ved, it deals with songs of praises. The Ajur Ved, it deals with sacrifices formulas. The Sam Ved deals with melody. And the Atharva Ved deals with remedies and magic formulas. These Vedas, according to the Hindus, they are the word of God Almighty. But they do not know exactly when were they revealed or when were they written. But most of the scholars unanimously say it was written about 4000 years ago. The other important holy scripture of the Vedas are the Puranas. <clears throat> the Puranas speak about the history of the universe, the history of the Aryans, the story of gods and deities. And these Puranas have been divided into 18 voluminous parts by Maharishi Vyas. And one among them is the Bhavishya Purana. The Purana speaking about Bhavishya, about the future. If you read the Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khand 3, Adhyata 3, Shlokas 5 to 8, it says that a Malikya, a spiritual teacher, will arrive with his companions. His name shall be Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Raja Bhoj, after giving this Mahadev Arab a bath in the Panchgarb and the Ganges water, he will address him with reverence and say, O pride of humankind, I pay obeisance to you. You have collected a great force against the devil and you have been protected from the enemies. 
if you analyze this prophecy in the Bhavishya Purana, Parv 3, Khand 3, Adhyatha 3, Shlokas 5 to 8, it speaks about a Malaycha. A Malaycha in Sanskrit means a foreigner speaking a foreign tongue. It says a foreigner speaking a foreign tongue. A spiritual leader will arise with his companions, that is the Sahabas, and his name shall be Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Raja Bhoj, after giving this Mahadev Arab a bath in the Panchgarav, that means it's an idiom saying that the person has been purified from all sins. And we know that all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are purified. They are masoons, they are sinless. It further says that he will address him as the pride of humankind. And we know that a beloved prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, is the pride of humankind. It's mentioned in Surah Al-Qalam, chapter number 68, verse number 4, that thou standest on the exalted standard of character. The Quran says in Surah Al-Hazab, chapter number 33, verse number 21, that you will find in the Messenger of Allah a beautiful pattern of conduct. And the Quran says in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, وَمَا illa إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humankind. If you read further in the Bhavishya Purana, Parv 3, Khand 3, Adhyatha 3, Shlokas 10 to 27, it says that the Malaychas have spoiled the land of the Arabs. Arya Dharm is not to be found there. There was a devil who God Almighty had destroyed earlier. But now he has been sent by a more powerful enemy. There will be a person who will be sent who will correct the devil and put the enemies on the true path. His name shall be Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the prophecy continues <coughs> that says to Raja Bhod that you need not go to the foolish land of the Pishachas for I through my kindness will purify you yourself. And a shrewd man in the form of Pishacha says that Arya Dharma will prevail in the world. Ishwar Paramatma has sent me and said that his follower will be a man who is circumcised, who will not have a tail on his head, will not have a shandy, he will sport a beard, he will create a revolution in the world, he will give the call for prayers, he will eat all lawful things, he will eat the animals but will not eat swine. He shall not be purified by the holy shrubs, that the vegetable, but will be purified by the sword. And because he will fight the irreligious people, he will be called as a Muslim man. And God Almighty will start this creed of meat eaters. If you analyze this prophecy, it speaks about a devil who God Almighty had destroyed earlier. Similar to the incidents mentioned in the Holy Quran in Surah Fil. In chapter number 105 we says, Alam Alam For me him min sijil, That fear thou not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with the companions of the elephant and let their treacherous plan go astray. And he sent against them flights of birds, striking them with stones of baked clay. And they were made to look like an empty field of straws and stalks, of whose corn had been eaten away. So the prophecy says, there was a devil, which the Quran speaks about Abraha and the army of elephants, who God Almighty had destroyed. This devil was destroyed, but now he has been sent by a more powerful enemy. And he will be put on the true path by a person called as Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the prophecy continues that Raja Bhoj need not go to the foolish land of the Pishachas because when the Muslims will come to India, they will be purified by the kindness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the prophecy continues that Ishwar Paramatma says that God Almighty, 
that my follower will be a man who is circumcised, who is not having a tail on the head, that is a shindi, will be keeping a beard, will create a revolution in the world, and he will give the call for prayers, that is the adan. And the prophecy continues, he will eat all lawful things, but will not have the flesh of swine. And the Holy Quran says in no less than four different places. In Surah Al-Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 173. In Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 3. In Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 145. And Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 115. It says, Hurrimat alaykumul maitutu waddamu wa lahmil kinzeel wa ma ahulla li gairin la bi. That is sovereign for you for food. Ah, dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah has been invoked. The Quran says the flesh of swine is prohibited. And the prophecy says the same, that these followers will not eat the flesh of swine. They will not be purified by the herbs that the vegetable, but by warfare. And because they will fight the irreligious people, they will be called as Musalman. This prophecy refers to no one but our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. There are even prophecies given in the Vedas, especially in the Atharva Ved. There are certain chapters in the Atharva Ved known as the Kuntap Sukhtas. The word Kuntap means free from trouble and misery. That means a message of peace. If you translate into Arabic, it means Islam. Kuntab also means the hidden glands in the abdomen, meaning that these verses of Atharva Ved have a hidden meaning which they will come to know in the future. And Kuntab also means, that means the navel of the earth, the center of the earth. And the holy city of Makkah is referred to as Ummul Qarah, the mother of all cities, as the center of the earth. So if you read the Kuntab Suktas, that is Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 127, verses 1 to 14, these are the Kuntab Suktas. Time does not permit us to go into the details of all the verses. I will pay emphasis to the first four verses. The first mantra says that he is Narashansa, he is Kaurama, and will be protected from 60,090 enemies. Mantra number two says, he will be a camel riding Rishi. Mantra three says, that he is Mahma Rishi, who has been given a hundred gold coins, ten necklaces, three hundred steeds of horses, and ten thousand cows. Mantra four says, his Vachyavesh rave. If you analyze these mantras, the first mantra says, he is Narashansa. Narashansa in Sanskrit, if you translate into English, means the praised worthy. If you translate into Arabic, it means Muhammad, peace be upon him, which was the name of a beloved prophet. It also says he is Kaurama. Kaurama means a person who is an immigrant and a beloved prophet. Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an immigrant. He migrated from Makkah to Medina. And further says that he will be protected from 60,090 enemies. This was the approximate population of Makkah that was against our beloved Prophet. Manza number two says that he will be a camel riding Rishi. No Brahmin, no Indian Rishi will ride the camel because according to the Manu Smriti, chapter number 11, verse number 202, it clearly states that a Brahmin is prohibited from riding a camel or an ass and he cannot bathe naked. He will have to suppress his bed to be purified. So but natural, this Rishi which the Puntap Sukta, Atharva Ved, speak about has to be a foreigner. Mantra number three says, he is Mahma Rishi. Mahma, if you translate into English, means exalted. And some of the times, some of the Hindu scriptures also say he is Muhammad Rishi. Peace be upon him. It further says he has been given hundred gold coins. These hundred gold coins refer to the first hundred sahabas 
of the beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, who accepted Islam and later migrated to Abyssinia and joined the Prophet in Medina. He has been given 10 necklaces. These 10 necklaces refer to the 10 people who had been promised paradise by the Prophet. It further says, he has been given 300 steeds. The Sanskrit word Arwa means an Arab horse which is very swift, an Arab steed. These 300 people, steeds, refer to the 300 companions of the Prophet who took part in the battle of Badr, who even though the enemy were thrice the number, yet they were victorious. It further says that he has been given 10,000 cows. The Sanskrit word go means cow. It also means victory. Cow is a symbol for victory and for peace. Referring to the approximate 10,000 population that was along with the Prophet during Fateh Mecca, conquest of Mecca. Mantra 4 says, he is rave. Rave, if you translate into English, means one who praises, one who prays. If you translate into Arabic, it means Ahmad, which was another name of a beloved Prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him. So these Kuntab Suktas refer to no other personality than our beloved Prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him. There are several prophecies in the Hindu scriptures. If you read the Tharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 6, it speaks about the battle of the Ali's, the battle of Ahzab and gives the description of the battle of Ahzab. The next verse of Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 7 says that, O God Almighty, you have overthrown the 20 kings and the 60,090 opponents of the praying one. The Sanskrit word Karu means the praying one. If you translate into Arabic, means Ahmad. That is the name of the beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It says that God Almighty has overthrown 20 kings. At the time of the Prophet, the Mecca had several, there were several tribes and each tribe had their own chief. And there were approximately 20 tribes during the time of the beloved Prophet, referring to the 20 kings which were overthrown. And again, the 60,090 enemies mentioned in the Tharva Ved refers to the population of Makkah that was against our beloved Prophet. The same prophecy is also mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 1, chapter number 53, verse number 9. But the Sanskrit word used is Sushrama, which if you translate means the praiseworthy. If you translate into Arabic, means Muhammad, peace be upon him, which was the name of the beloved Prophet. Again in Psalm Ved, in the Psalm Ved, again the prophecy is given in book number 2, chapter number 6, verse number 8, that Ahmad will be given the divine eternal law, may peace be upon him. But natural, Ahmad is the name of the beloved Prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was given the Holy Quran, to whom was revealed the Holy Quran. There are several verses in the Hindu scriptures, but time does not permit us to deal with all the various prophecies of our beloved Prophet in the Hindu scriptures. Now let's discuss the prophecy of our beloved Prophet in the Parsi scriptures. Prophet Zoroaster is the prophet of the religion of Zoroastrianism or Parsiism, also known as the fire worshippers or Meganism. This religion originated about two and a half thousand years ago in Persia. And they have got two holy scriptures, the Dasatir and the Avesta. The Dasatir is further divided into Khurda Dasatir and Kalan Dasatir. The Avesta is further divided into Khurda Avesta and Kalan Avesta, or Zend Avesta or Maha Zen. These holy scriptures of the party have been written in Pahalvi and Zendi and a few of them in the cuneiform language. There are several prophecies even in the Parsi scriptures about the advent of the beloved prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. <coughs> if you read the Zend Avesta, chapter number 28, 
verse number 129, which is also mentioned in the sacred books of the East, <coughs> volume number 23, Zen Avesta part number 2, page number 220, it says that he is victorious, he is Soshian, his name is Astavit Areta. The Soshian, the beneficent one, will benefit the whole of humankind. The Astavit Areta, being a bodily creature, will fight against the evil of the humankind and will fight against the drug of the two-footed brood. If you analyze this prophecy, it says that he is victorious. And we know our beloved Prophet was victorious during Fateh Mecca. It says he is Socian. Socian, according to the Hastings Encyclopedia, <coughs> it means praiseworthy which we translate into Arabic means Muhammad, peace be upon him. It further says, his name will be Astavit Areta. Astavit Areta has been derived from the Sanskrit word Astu, meaning one who prays, one who praises, or by Sita down, the Persian word, which means the praying one, which we translate into Arabic means Ahmad, which was another name of a beloved prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him. It further says that he will benefit the whole of humankind. And Quran says in Surah Al Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, that we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humankind. The prophecy further says that he will be Asta with Areta, who will fight against the evil of the humankind and will fight against the drug of the two-footed brood. And we know that our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, fought against the evil of the humankind. If you further read in the Zed Avesta, Zamyad Yasht, chapter number 16, verse number 95, also mentioned in the sacred books of the East, volume 23, Zed Avesta part 2, page number 308, it says, that his friends, the friends of Astavit Areta, they will be against the devil. They will be well thinking, well hearing, well seeing, and will have good moral values. And not a single falsehood had been uttered from these companions. This was of friend Avesta again speaks about the beloved prophet calling him as Astavit Areta. The praising one. Translated to Arabic means Ahmad, peace be upon him. And it speaks about his companions, the Sahabas, which says that they will fight against the evil. They will be well thinking, well seeing, well hearing, well behaving, will have good moral values, and they will not utter a single falsehood. There are even prophecies in the Dasatil. That the Parsi scriptures about the advent of a beloved prophet. It says that when the Zoroastrians, the followers of Zoroaster, when they go away from the teaching of the prophet and will become dissolute, there will be a person who will arise along with his companions who will subjugate the Persians, who will defeat the arrogant Persians. And these followers, they will not worship the fire, but will face towards the Kaaba, the house of Abraham, peace be upon him, which will be free from all the idols. And these people will be a mercy to the whole of humankind. They will rule the land, the sacred land of the Parsis, that is Persia, Bas and Talkhand. And this man will be eloquent and generous. This prophecy fits to no one but the beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and speaks about the Sahabas who stopped the fire worship and prayed towards the house of Ibrahim salam while they offered the prayers. If you further read in the Bandai Shiyash chapter number 60 verse number 6 to 27 it says that Soshiant will be the last prophet. 
That means the praiseworthy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him will be the last prophet which is the same thing mentioned in Surah Ahzab chapter number 33 verse number 40 which says Khatamun Nabi'een the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the seal of the prophets. Let's analyze the prophecy of the beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him in the Buddhist scriptures. If you read the Buddhist scriptures that is Chakkawati Sinna Sultana, D11-76. It gives the prophecy of a Maitri. And this prophecy is repeated in most of the sacred scriptures of the Buddhists. It says that there will be coming a Buddha by the name of Maitri, who will be a holy one, a supreme one, the enlightened one, endowed with knowledge, will have wisdom, will be auspicious, will have knowledge of the universe, will receive eternal law, supreme knowledge. He will preach a religion which will be glorious at the beginning, at the climax and at the goal. He will preach the religion of truth same as the Buddha. But this Maitri will have thousands of followers while Buddha has only hundreds. This prophecy is further repeated in the sacred books of the age that this Buddha who will come by the name of Maitri, he will have thousands of followers while present Buddha has only hundreds. It's also repeated in the Gospel of Buddha by Taris, page number 217 and 218. Now if you analyze the word Maitri, it means a beneficent one, a merciful one, a person who's kind, who's loving, who's merciful. And one Arabic equivalent word for Maitri is Rahmat and our beloved Prophet the Holy Quran mentions in Surah Al-Anbiya chapter 21 verse number 107 وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ لِلْعَالَمِينَ that we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humankind and every chapter of the Holy Quran except for Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 begins with a beautiful formula Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful and the word mercy is mentioned in the Holy Quran no less than 409 times so this Maitri which the prophecy speaks about refers to no one but our beloved prophet Muhammad peace be upon him further if you read in the Buddhist scriptures in Mahapari Nibbana chapter number 2 verse number 32 which is also mentioned in the sacred books of the East volume number 11 page number 36 it says that the Buddha will not differentiate his teachings between exoteric and esoteric the Buddha should speak the truth and should not have his knowledge should not be like a closed fist of the teacher that means whatever he teaches should not be something which is partly open and partly closed and we know our beloved prophet spoke about the Holy Quran in public and even today the Holy Quran is recited in public and he said that none of the Muslims should hide the teaching of the Holy Quran from the other human beings if we further read in Mahapari Nibbana Sultana chapter number 5 verse number 36 in the sacred books of the East volume number 11 page number 97 it says that as the Buddha had a servitor by the name of Ananda so will the Buddha Maitri to come will also have a servitor and the servitor of the beloved prophet was Anas may Allah be pleased with him who was given by his parents his mother and father to the holy prophet at the age of age and the prophet called him as his beloved son or the beloved little one and Anas may Allah be pleased with him he stayed by the Prophet at the time of war and peace even in good times as well as bad times till the end of his life and even during the battle of Uhud even at the age of 11 he stood by the Prophet and protected the Prophet when he was surrounded by the enemy even in battle of Hunayn when the archers fired at the Prophet he was there to protect the Prophet you can very well compare him to Ananda who even when the mad elephant rushed at Buddha 
Ananda stood by Buddha. Further, if you read the Gospel of Buddha by Taras, page number 214, it gives six criteria for the Maitri. And all these six criteria fit perfectly to our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It says that he will receive enlightenment at night. When he receives enlightenment, he will be lit up. He will die a natural death. He will die at night time. And you know how the Daisha, may Allah be pleased with the said that when the Prophet was dying, there was no oil in the lamp and she borrowed oil from the neighbor, indicating that the Prophet died during night time. Point number five says that when the Maitri will die, he will again be lit up. He will become bright. And last is, once he dies in the physical form, he will never appear in the physical form in this world, which refers to no one but a beloved Prophet. There are several prophecies. Before the read, in the, in the Dhamma Padda, Sacred Books of the East, Volume 10, page number 67, it says that the Tattaghatas, that means the Buddhas, they are only preachers. And the Holy Quran says, in Surah Ghashya, chapter 88, verse number 21, it says, Fazakkir inna ma'anta muzakkir. For your job is to deliver the message. The job of the messenger was only to deliver the message. His job was not to convert the people. Same Dhamma Padda, Sacred Books of the East, volume number 10, page number 67 says that the criteria for attaining salvation is righteousness, which is similar to as mentioned in the Holy Quran in Surah Al Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, which says, Wal As, Innal Insana fi khus. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَآمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ That by the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, that is to da'wah, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. These are the minimum four criteria for a person to enter Jannah according to the Holy Quran, and one of them is righteousness. Let's discuss the prophecies of a beloved prophet in the Jewish and the Christian scriptures. Before we discuss that, I would like to relate to you an incident which took place between Reverend Paul Fender and Maulana Alhamdulillah Karanvi. Before we got our independence, Reverend Paul Fender asked Maulana Alhamdulillah Karanvi to have a debate. The Maulana said, that I don't know English, I only know Urdu. So after a few months, Paul Fender, he learned Urdu and said, okay, now I know Urdu, let's have a debate in Urdu. So during the debate, Paul Fender said, that why don't you start? So Mahana Sahib said, since you are our guest, you should start first. So Reverend Paul, he said, that, Is your Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is he dead or alive? So Mahana Sahib said that spiritually he's alive, he's Hayatul Nabi, but physically he's dead, he's buried in Medina. The next question the Reverend asked that where is your Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him now? So the Mahana thought for a while and said that he is next to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Janat Firdaus. The Reverend asked the next question. Where was your Prophet during the battle of Karbala? So the Maulana gave the same reply with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Janat e Firdaus. So Maulana asked the next question. Where was he when his grandsons, Hussein and Hassan, may Allah be pleased with them, when they were being martyred in Karbala? Where was the Prophet? So Maulana paused for a while and then said that he was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Janat e Firdaus. So the Reverend asked the next question. When your Prophet was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with God Almighty, when his grandsons were being killed, why didn't he request, why didn't he tell God Almighty to save his grandsons? So there was a long pause. Maulana Sahib was silent. And the Muslim audience thought, Maulana Sahib gay. Now he's gone. What did he answer? There was a long pause. So the Reverend said, Marana Sahib, why don't you answer? Why didn't your Prophet tell God Almighty to save his grandsons when he was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
After a long pause, the Maulana said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cried. The Reverend said, what? Allah cried? He said, yes. Allah said, when I could not save my own son from the cross, how will I save your grandsons? This is battle of wits. The Holy Quran says, speak with hikmah. That is, invite all the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. This is a battle of wits. When someone corners you, you should use your hikmah. Well, this is not the right answer, but he used his hikmah to turn the tables over. So let's discuss the prophecy of our beloved prophet in the Jewish and the Christian scriptures. The Holy Bible is divided into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament deals with the stories of all the prophets that came before Jesus, peace be upon him. And the New Testament deals with the life of the messenger, Jesus, peace be upon him. If you read the Holy Bible of the Catholics, the Dewey version, it has got 73 books. If you read the other edition, Good News Bible, it has 81 books. But the main Dewey version has got 73 books. The Bible of the Protestants has only 66 books. They say that seven books from the Old Testament, they are apocryphal, they apocryphy. The masses of the people don't understand the meaning of apocryphy. It means doubtful. So therefore the Protestant Christians, they don't believe in, in these six books. So the Old Testament of the Catholics contains 46 books. The Old Testament of the Protestants, it contains 39 books. The New Testaments of both contain 27 books. The Holy Quran says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 157, that the Jews and Christians, they follow a messenger, the unlettered prophet, which is mentioned in the law and the gospel. So if you read the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18, it says, <coughs> God Almighty says, that I shall raise thee up a prophet, from among thy brethren, like unto thee, and I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak all that I command him. If you ask the Christian that who does this prophecy refer to, he will say it refers to Jesus, peace be upon him. And to make it fit Jesus, peace be upon him, he will say that see, since Moses, peace be upon him, was a prophet, even Jesus, peace be upon him, was a prophet. Since Moses, peace be upon him, was a Jew. Even Jesus, peace be upon him, was a Jew. So this prophecy fits to no one but Jesus, peace be upon him. The prophecy says he should be like Moses. If these two are the only criteria that the person should be a prophet and should be a Jew, then all the prophets mentioned in the Bible after prophet Moses, peace be upon him, like Solomon, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, John the Baptist, May peace be upon them all. All these prophets fulfilled the prophecy because all were Jewish and all of them were prophets of God Almighty. In fact, if you analyze, this prophecy fits to no one better than our beloved prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Because Moses peace be upon him and prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, both of them, they had mother and father. Prophet Jesus peace be upon him was born miraculously without any male intervention. He only had a mother, he had no father. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is more like Moses, peace be upon him. And Jesus, peace be upon him, is unlike Moses, peace be upon him. Both Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they were married and had children. According to the Bible, Jesus, peace be upon him, was not married, neither did he have any children. Both Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they died a natural death. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to the Holy Quran, he was raised up alive. According to the false reading of the Bible, they say he was crucified on the cross. Anyway, he did not die a natural death. Both Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they bought new laws. Jesus, peace be upon him, bought no new law. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17. 
that think not I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. So according to the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that he brought no new law. Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them both, besides being prophets of God Almighty, they were even worldly kings. Worldly kings mean if they wanted, they could give any other human being the punishment of death. They were worldly kings. This was not the case with Jesus, peace be upon him. Both Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they were accepted by the people as a whole later on. But Jesus, peace be upon him, it's mentioned in the Gospel that in the Gospel of John, he approached his own and his own forsook him. That means his own did not accept him. So if you analyze, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is more like Moses, peace be upon him. And Jesus, peace be upon him, is unlike Moses, peace be upon him. This prophecy fits to no one but our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And further says that I shall put my words into his mouth and he shall speak all that I command him. And we know that the Holy Quran was a revelation given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through Archangel Gabriel. And whatever was revealed to him, he repeated it verbatim, as though words were put in his mouth. And the next verse of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, Verse number 19 says that if anyone does not hearken unto my words, I shall require it of him. One particular version says, I shall take revenge. That means any person who believes in the Bible, who does not hearken unto the words of this prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take revenge from him. It's further mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29 verse number 12 that when the book will be given to the prophet and when he will be asked to read he will say that I am not learned and we know that when the first revelation came to our beloved prophet when Archangel Gabriel said Ikra our beloved prophet replied Ma ana bikari Ma ana bikari which means I am not learned this prophecy again which to no one but our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Even the name of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is mentioned by name in the Holy Bible, in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in the book of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. The Hebrew quotation is, Hikko mametakim vikulli muhammadim zahdudi wa zahrai baina Jerusalem. It's a Hebrew quotation which says, Hikko mametakim Muhammadim. The word Muhammad to it is added M because in the Hebrew language if you give respect to anyone M is added like how you have Elo for God you say Elohim it's a respect same to the word Muhammad is added M Muhammadim peace be upon him so in the original Hebrew text of the Old Testament Song of Solomon chapter number 5 verse number 16 our beloved prophet is mentioned by name but the translation says that he is most sweet, he is altogether lovely. The Hebrew word Muhammadim has been translated into altogether lovely. He is most sweet, he is altogether lovely. He is my friend, he is my beloved, O daughters of Jerusalem. But in the original text, the word Muhammadim is there. Let's discuss the prophecies in the Christian scriptures. All the prophecies that are mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible are also to be followed by the Christians. In addition to the Old Testament, they also believe in the New Testament. The Holy Quran says in Surah Taf, chapter number 61, verse number 5, that Jesus, peace be upon him, the son of Mary, was sent as a messenger to the children of Israel, to the Bani Israel, confirming the law that came before them and giving glad tidings of a prophet to come whose name shall be Ahmad peace be upon him the Holy Quran says in Surah Saf chapter number 61 verse number 6 that the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him prophet Ahmad peace be upon him will be prophesied in the scriptures of the Christians besides he being mentioned in the Old Testament he is also prophesied in the New Testament it's mentioned in the Gospel of John 
chapter number 14, verse number 16. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that I shall pray to my Father, to God Almighty, to send you another comforter who will abide with you forever. The Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 26 says that when this comforter will come to you, who will be sent by my Father, he will glorify me, he will testify me. It's further mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7, that nevertheless I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. For if I depart, shall I send him. Now if you analyze in the Greek, original Greek manuscript that you have, the word used is paracletus. It's actually a corrupted form of the original word perikletos, which if you translate means the praiseworthy or the praising one. If you translate to Arabic, means Muhammad or Ahmad, peace be upon him. So in the original manuscript, in the original Greek, Perikletos means Ahmad or Muhammad, peace be upon him. Even if you agree that it is not Perikletos, it's Perikletos, the exact translation is not comforter, it means an advocate or a friend. But irrespective of whether the Christians, whether they say it's Perikletos or Parakletos, whether it is praiseworthy or praising one or the kind one or comforter or advocate, Alhamdulillah, all these meanings fit our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. The Christian may say that this comforter which the Bible refers to is the Holy Spirit. It does not refer to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So you have to remind them. The prophecy says in the Gospel of John chapter number 16 verse number 7 that nevertheless I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. For if I depart, shall I send him. That means the criteria for the comforter to come is that Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, should go away. And the Holy Spirit which the Christians speak about was already there before Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came. It was there in the womb of Elizabeth. It was there when Jesus Christ was being baptized, peace be upon him. So surely it cannot refer to the Holy Spirit and it only refers to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. There are several prophecies. It further mentions the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, that I have yet many things to say unto you. Jesus Christ peace be upon him says that I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the Spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truths. He shall tell you things to come. He shall glorify me. This spirit of truth which the Holy Bible speaks about is no one but a beloved prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him. The prophecy of prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is very clearly given even in the New Testament. <clears throat> and the Holy Quran says in Surah Hakaf, chapter number 46, Verse number 10, that tell to the people that see you not that this is a book from God Almighty, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you reject it. Even after a witness from amongst you, from amongst the Ahli Kitab testifies to its similarity with the early scriptures. He was a believer. But you are arrogant and Allah guides not the unjust people. The prophecy, the Holy Quran says that don't you see that this is a book from God Almighty, the Holy Quran. And you non-Muslim reject it, whether it be the Hindus, whether it be the Parsis, whether it be the Buddhists, whether it be the Jews, whether it be the Christians, it says this book is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a witness from amongst you has already testified to its similarities about the prophet or beloved prophet and you reject it. The witness from amongst you was a believer and you are arrogant people, you are unjust. And Allah guides not the unjust people. I would like to end my talk by quoting a verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Kawsar, chapter number 108, verse number 123, which says 
which means that we have granted thee, that is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the fount of abundance, the Jannah, the fount of abundance. So turn to thy Lord in prayer and sacrifice. And anyone who hated thee, that is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he will be cut off from all future hope. Wa akhirat dawan, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. To make this question and answer session more effective and useful, I would like that each member comes out with one question at a time and uh, preferably short and up to the point as informed on the topic of the day, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him in the various religious scriptures of the world or on the topic Islam and comparative religion or any question a non-Muslim may have asked Muslims which they were unable to answer and the members, the guests can ask the question in the mic or they can just send a letter. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We are really lucky, alhamdulillah, that our Dr. Zakir Karim Sahib is here in Madras. But since the question and answer session is there, I would like to just put forth before him the questions have been asked to me by non-Muslims very often, but I am still not able to answer to them in a correct perspective manner. Dr. Saab, it is our firm belief that the believers will go to Jannah and the non-believers will go to hell. But a Hindu or a Christian often asks me that we are born in a Hindu family or we are born in a Christian family and naturally we will continue to have to follow the same religion. It is not our fault whether we will also go to hell forever or shall we also go to heaven. And second question I used to tell them, you are supposed to read the Holy Quran and understand the religion. But another firm belief is, even a Muslim, we should not supposed to touch the Quran without wazoo. We have to be wazoo and then only we must read Quran. But how can a non-believer who is not a Muslim, when Muslims, we ourselves cannot touch the Quran, how can a non-believer can touch the Quran and read? That is a question I am not able to answer. Could you please answer this? Thank you. The learned brother has asked two questions. The first one is that the non-Muslims say that according to Islam, only the believers, only the Muslims will go to Jannah. How are we to blame that as a Hindu and a Christian, if he's born in a Hindu family, a Christian family, we should blame God Almighty. Well, God Almighty put us in a Christian family and a Hindu family. So how, according to Islam, isn't your Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unjust that because we are born in a non-Muslim family, we will be put to hell? The answer that you can give is that according to our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, every child is born in Deen al-Fit. Deen al -fit means the innate religion. Every child is born as a Muslim irrespective whether he's born in a Hindu family, a Muslim family, a Christian family, a Parsi family or a Buddhist family, every child is born as a Muslim. What is the meaning of the word Muslim? Muslim means one who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, by the influence of his elders, the influence of his parents, influence of a teacher, our beloved prophet said, he starts doing idol worship, he starts worshipping fire and he goes away from Sirat al-Mustaqim and goes on the wrong track. Therefore, when a non-Muslim accepts Islam, we prefer using the word revert than the English word convert. Convert means going from one track to the other track. Revert means every human being initially is a Muslim. By the influence of other people, he goes on the wrong track. And later on, he is reverted back to the correct Sirat al-Mustaqim, that is Islam. So therefore, revert is a more appropriate word for a non-Muslim who becomes a Muslim than the English word convert. So every child is born in Deen al -Fit. If you ask, what proof do you have today? There was a research done on two tribes, the Kapauku tribe and the tribe of Australian aborigines. These two tribes 
did not come in contact with modern civilization till as late as 1950. When the researchers went and tried to find out the way of life, they were following Islam in everything except in name. They believed there was one God, they believed he was almighty, he was omnipresent, he was omnipotent, he did not beget, nor was he begotten. They did the sujood when they prayed to this God almighty. They were following Islam, everything but in name. They didn't call themselves Muslims. But indeed, they were Muslim. So if we do an experiment today, that if you take a child from a Hindu family, one from a Christian family, one from a Buddhist family, the moment the child is born, isolate him from the other human beings. Let him come up absolutely without in contact with any other human being. Isolate him and let him grow up. See to it he gets food but does not come in contact with any other human being. After he grows up, if you try and learn his philosophy, it will be everything of Islam but in name. Because this is the innate religion Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in every human being the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the religion of Islam. And Quran says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 172 and 173, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before the human beings came in this world, He bought the children of Adam from the loins and He asked all the human beings before they came in this world, they were asked, the souls were asked, that do you believe there is one God? And all of them testified, yes, we believe there is only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, the memory was washed and they have come into this world. It is their duty to find the truth. But even if they don't find the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it upon himself to deliver the message of Islam. It's the duty of Muslims to dawah. But in spite of that, Allah says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 53, He says, Sanurihim ayatina filafakhi. That soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest regions of the horizons and into their soul until it is clear to them that this is the truth. Allah takes it up upon Himself that in every individual soul, besides showing His signs in the horizon, the sun, the moon, the trees, etc., He will even make it clear into their soul that this is the truth. But later on, after accepting the truth, many people, they agree with it, but they don't accept it because if they accept it, if they become Muslims, they may go lost in business. They may lose their friends. So for material gain, they do not accept the truth. They agree with it, but they don't accept it. And Allah says very clearly that by the age of 40, every human being will agree that there is one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least once in the lifetime. So, the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given to every human being and every human being is born as a Muslim. Later on he goes to the wrong track. Regarding that will Muslims go to Jannah. Only by saying La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah you do not get a ticket to heaven. There are many Muslims who feel that only by saying the Shahada you go to Jannah. The criteria for going to Jannah is mentioned as I said in my talk in Surah Al-Asr chapter number 103 verse number 1 to 3 we say Wal Asr إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَآمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَكِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ That by the token of time, man is very in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to patience and perseverance, those who exhort people to truth, that is to Dawa and Islam. These are the minimum four criteria for a person to go to Jannah. If any one of these four criteria is missing, According to Surah Al-Asr, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a good Muslim, you may have Iman, you may be offering the Salah, you may have gone for Hajj, but if you don't do Dawah, if you don't deliver the message, you shall not enter Jannah. All four criteria are required for a person to enter Jannah. Not only saying the Shahada. The person should have belief, should have righteous deed, that it should be honest, etc. Should invite people to truth, do Dawah, and invite people to patience and perseverance. Only being born in a Muslim family will not transport to Jannah. Hope this answers the first question. Regarding the second question, that Muslims are supposed to do wudu and touch the Quran, how will the non-Muslim read the Quran? And normally, I'll be dealing with this topic in detail tomorrow, inshallah, in the morning. Al-Quran should it be read with understanding. I'll be dealing with the subject in detail. But just to answer briefly, 
what the Muslims refer to the verse in the Holy Quran from Surah Waqiyah, chapter number 56, verse number 77 to 80, which says that Quran is most honorable, a book well guarded, which none shall touch except those who are pure, except those who are clean. Here when the Holy Quran says none shall touch it, it does not mean physical touching. Any non-Muslim, they can easily take a Holy Quran and touch it and the Quran will be proved wrong. They can purchase a copy of the Holy Quran for 100 rupees or 200 rupees and they can touch it, the Quran will be proved wrong. When the Quran says none will be able to touch it, touch here does not mean physical touch. It means no one will be able to understand the Quran, will be able to derive the benefit of the Quran, will be able to assimilate the Quran, except those who are clean. Cleanliness does not mean body cleanliness. It means cleanliness besides of the body. It also means cleanliness of the heart, of the soul and of the mind. Touching the Quran without wudu also you can't touch the Quran. It's not a fard, wudu should be there. You should not be najis in ceremonial impurity. Cleanliness here means you should not be in ceremonial impurities. That's for the Muslim who believe in the Quran. Otherwise, even without wudu you can touch the Quran. It's preferable to be in wudu. It's not a fard. But you cannot be in ceremonial impurity. We may pose the question that these non-Muslims, these kafirs, these mushriks, they are najis. How can they touch the Quran? See, the Holy Quran is not meant only for the Muslims. It was meant for the whole of humankind. It's mentioned in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52, in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185, and Surah Al-Zumur, chapter 33, verse number 41, that the Quran was revealed for the whole of humankind. It was not only revealed for the Muslims or the Arabs, but for the whole of humankind. And a prophet, as I mentioned, was sent for the whole of humankind, not only for the Muslims. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds me responsible for giving the copy of the Holy Quran to the non-Muslims, I will be in good company. Because even a beloved prophet, he dictated letters in which verses of the Quran were mentioned. He gave to the non-Muslim kings. And one such letter is preserved in Turkey in the Koptaki Museum, which says, and it quotes one of the ayats of the Holy Quran, which says, Bismillah rahman rahim Kul ya hilal kitab, O people of the book, that come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na the illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi. That we associate to partners with Him. That we erect not among ourselves lords and fates other than Allah. Find tawallahu. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. Say we bear witness. They are not Muslimun. That we are Muslims bowing over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the Holy Quran was dictated by a beloved prophet and sent to non-Muslim kings. Some accepted Islam while the others tore that letter and trampled it beneath their feet. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds me responsible, I will be in the company of a beloved prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. When he can give the Holy Quran to the non-Muslims, why can't I give? People say, no, you should give only the translation, not the Arabic portion. I am asking, there are 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. The Arabs, Arabic is the mother tongue, but they are Christians from birth. Means they were born in a Christian family. By birth they were Muslim, but they were born in a Christian family. Which translation of the Quran will you give to these Christian Arabs? You have to give the original Quran. So very well, you can give the Holy Quran to the non-Muslims. Even if they make a mistake of touching the Quran, it's a minor mistake. What we have to prevent them from doing is the biggest mistake of shirk. The Holy Quran says, Come to come in terms that between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'abda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi. That we associate no partners with him. We are preventing the non-Muslim from doing the biggest sin of shirk. These small sins don't carry any weight in front of shirk. So this is the teaching of the Holy Quran and the teaching of a beloved prophet. You can and you should give the Holy Quran to the non-Muslim so that they will have no excuse on the day of judgment saying that we did not get the message of Islam. If you have a non-Muslim neighbor and he's a mushrik, if you do not deliver the message to him and on the day of judgment, Allah will question him. Then why didn't you accept Islam? He said, I didn't get the message. Allah says it was your job to get the message. I gave it to you. You go to hell. Allah will pose you the question, why didn't you deliver the message to your non-Muslim friend? 
Did you deliver the message? And if you say, I have not delivered the message, even you will follow him. Even you will go to Jahannam. I hope that answers the question. Well, the most welcome. First, we'll entertain the question from the mic. And inshallah, if time permits, we'll entertain the question from the slips. If there's any question on sister side, I believe they can write it on, the, on a slip and send it forward. How to impress, how to impress upon the non-believer of the holy book, the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who are themselves are not reading the holy scripture, they don't know what is Gita, they don't know what is Pranas, they accept the praise of the Lord Krishna by stealing a butter or uh, fluting the bugle or anything. How we have to be a mobile like you, to impress upon a non-believer to accept the Holy Quran believes into the entire system of the universe, the faith of the people, and by ending it with Fatmul Muslim. If I hope, if I am not wrong in my question, do you understand? The question posed by the brother was that the Hindus they don't themselves read the Gita, they don't know much about their own holy scriptures, they only know about fish and etc. So how do we do dawah with them? What do we have to tell them? That you have to ask them, as the Quran says, that come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. That we associate to partner with Him. The Holy Quran says, the best way of doing da'wah is to say, Allah na'buda illallah. If they quote about Krishna, you have to say, Dear brother, my Hindu friend, where do you come to know about Krishna? So he will say in Mahabharat, in Bhagavad Gita, let him do the job. Bhagavad Gita is one of the holy scripture of the Hindus. So you have to say, since you believe in Bhagavad Gita and you quote Krishna, Bhagavad Gita also says in chapter number 7, verse number 19 to 23, it says, all those who do idol worship, they are materialistic people. And those who do idol worship, they are materialistic people. They say, when they speak about Krishna and other lords, they say we come to know about these things from the Vedas. So I gave a talk quoting from the Vedas that if you say you believe in Lord Krishna because it's mentioned in Mahabharat, in Gita, you believe in certain Lord Ram because you believe in Ramayan, because you believe in the Vedas, etc. So if you believe in parts of Vedas, you have to believe as a whole. Your Vedas even prophesied the advent of a beloved prophet. And I gave quotation from Atharva Ved, from Brig Ved, from Sam Ved about the prophecy of beloved prophet. You can even speak to them, Allah na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi, that we associate no partner with him. You have to tell them, it's mentioned in your Ved, in the Rig Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. It says, na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, no image can be made. It's a Sanskrit quotation. In the same Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 8, it says that God is imageless and bodiless. Same Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 9 says, All those who worship the Asambhuti, that means the natural things like water, earth, air, they are in darkness. And the verse continues in Sanskrit. Andhatma Pavishanti Ya Sambhuti Mupaste. They are entering more in darkness those who worship the created things, the Sambhuti, like table, chair, idol, etc. Who says that? Don't talk about the Quran. Your scripture says that. Your scripture also says, Ekam Braham Dustya Naste. Niya Naste Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai. Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Dara bhi Nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So you have to say, Tala Vila Kalmitin Sava in Baina Baina Kum. That come to come in terms as between us and you. If they don't know their scriptures, you memorize certain verses of their scriptures which match with the Holy Quran. Because the Quran is the Furqan. We don't agree that their scripture is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scripture that they have, the Veda, we don't agree it is totally the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By name, we know four revelations. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil and the Furqan. But the Holy Quran also says in other places, in Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 38, it says that we have sent a revelation to every nation. Several revelations were sent down. By name we know four. So Veda, if a Hindu asks, is it a revelation of God Almighty? I say, I don't know. It may be. But even if it is a revelation of God Almighty, it was only meant for that time. 
Today you have to believe in last and final revelation that is the Holy Quran, not in a revelation which was time bound. Even if it was, I can't say for sure. I'm not saying it's the word of God. But we can use the Quran. Quran is the Furqan, the criteria to judge right from wrong. You can use the criteria to know that so there are certain parts in the Bible which match the Quran, which we say this part of the Bible we can say may be the word of God. This part of the Veda which says that Ya Ek Is Mushtihi, there is only one God, worship Him alone. Rig Ved, volume number 6, chapter number 45, verse number 16, may be a word of God. But the whole Veda, we don't agree the word of God. Hope that answers the question. We'll just take a question from Chetan, inshallah, we'll come back to you. The question is now that you have tried to prove the advent of Prophet Muhammad through some of certain Eastern religious Eastern uh -huh. scriptures. Can we presume that the majority people of India are people of the book? If yes, can we marry them without converting them? The right word is reversion, as I said, as this is allowed in respect of the people of the book. The meaning of the people of the book, Ahle Kitab, Ahle Kitab means people of the book. One of the meaning of Kitab is also revelation, people of the revelation. Ahle Kitab means people of the revelation. In that way, even the Muslims are Ahle Kitab. But when the Quran speaks about Ahle Kitab, it is particularly referring to the people of the law and the gospel, the people of the Torah and the Injil, referring to Jews and Christians. So whenever Quran gives a reference, we have to read in context. So when Quran says Ahle Kitab, it refers to no one but Jews and Christians. It does not refer to Muslims. When Quran says, Ya Ahle Kitab, Wala Taqulu Salasa, O people of the book, don't say Trinity. Do Muslims say Trinity? We are Ahle Kitab. Do we say Trinity? No. So when the Quran says Ahle Kitab in context, it's referring to a particular Ahle Kitab, only Jews and Christians, not the Muslims and the other people. Regarding the second part of the question, since the prophecy of Muhammad peace be upon mentioned in the Hindu scriptures, can we say the Ahle Kitab? No, sister. As I said, we cannot say for sure that Veda is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It may be. Even if it is, it is outdated. It's outdated. We have to believe in the last and final revelation that the Holy Quran and no other book today. It may be the word of God. Can we marry them? No. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 221, it says that do not marry unbelieving women. Do not marry unbelieving women, mushrik women, those women who do shirk, unless they believe, until they believe, even a believing woman who is a slave woman, she is better than an unbelieving woman, a mushrik woman, even if she allows you. So Quran says, don't marry mushrik women, unless they become believers. Even a Muslim woman, a Jharuwali, who is a believer, who is a Muslim, she is better than the mushrik, even if she allows you. She may be the queen of England. She may be the most wealthiest woman in the world. She may be the most beautiful woman in the world. But yet, a Jharuwali, who is a Muslim woman, she is much better than the queen of England, even if she allows you. If she is a mushrik, a Muslim woman, a Jharuwali, is better than the queen of England if she does shirk. Similarly, for a man, the white words I applied, that a believing woman should not marry a mushrik man unless he believes. A Jharuwala, a Muslim Jharuwala is much better than a mushrik even if he allows you. He may be Princess Charles, he may be Richard Gere, the most handsome man, he may be Amitabh Bachchan. But if he does shirk, a Jharuwala who is a Muslim is much better than Amitabh Bachchan if he does shirk. Quran says that you are not allowed to marry mushriks. I know there is a verse in the Holy Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 5, which says, you are allowed to marry the woman of the Ahle Kitab. But you can only marry those women from the Ahle Kitab who are modest, not those who do shirk. Because Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72, it says that they say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon them, the son of Mary, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Waqal al Masih. But said Christ, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Inno Mushrik Billah, anyone who associates partners with Allah, Fakad Haram Allah wa Layal Jannah, Allah will make Jannah Haram for him. Wama wa Hunnar, Wama al Isdal min al Ansar, and fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the year after. That means, 
even among the Ahle Kitab, among the Jews and Christians, there are people who do shirk. In no mushrik billah, anyone who associates partners with Allah, faqad haram Allah wale wal jannah, Allah will make jannah haram for him. So you cannot marry those Ahle Kitab women, Jews and Christians who do shirk. You can only marry those Ahle Kitab who don't do shirk. And this is mentioned today. Al Imran chapter 3 verse 110 that minhumul mu'minun wa aqsamul fasikun among the ahli kitab there are some who are believers but the majority are poverty transgressors so you can marry those ahli kitab women those who don't do shirk and those who have iman hope that answers the question but that pose the question that there are some non-muslim like christians etc who can show about moral characters to the muslims etc they are better than them what happened to these good characters Brother, as I mentioned, the criteria to go to Jannah are four. Upon Surya Allah, sir. One is Iman, one is righteous deed, Tawasu bil Haq, doing Dawah and Isra, Tawasu bil Sub, inviting people to patient perseverance. If they are very good in righteous deed, suppose you are paying for an examination and there are four subjects science, geography, history, and mathematics. If you get 100 out of 100 in maths, and the other three you fail, will you overall pass? You will fail. You have to pass in all four. So even in righteous deed if they are good, yet they will not enter Jannah. Similarly for a Muslim, he may have Iman, but if he doesn't have righteous deed, he will not enter Jannah. He should have Iman, he should have righteous deed, he should do Dawa, and he should exhort people to patience and perseverance. There are people who say that you Muslims, you Muslims, are, and, they, and they criticize. There are people who are dishonest, you don't follow this and that. You have to tell them that you have to judge the religion according to the authentic source. That is the Holy Quran and the Hadith, not by what individual Muslims do. Suppose you want to judge a car as a Mercedes car, how good it is. If a person who does not know how to drive the car, if he sits on the steering wheel, he will bang up the car. Will you say the car is bad? No, you say the driver does not know how to drive the car. So if you have to judge Islam, judge by the authentic sources of the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, not by what Muslims do. And if you want to have an exemplary Muslim, the best example, as the Holy Quran says, is the beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Hope that answers the question. The weather says, justify the, the words of the Holy Quran, Lakum deen wa And many Muslims quote this, Lakum deen wa To use your way to me is mine. Therefore, you should not do dawah to the Hindu. He can be a Hindu, he can be a Christian, he can be a Parsi. All will go to Jannah. Lakum dinu kumbal yadin. Brother, you are quoting out of context. You are quoting a verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Kafirun, chapter number 109, verse number 6. But you are quoting out of context. For the complete context, you have to go to the first five verses. It says, Qul ya ayyuhal kafiruna, la abudu ma ta'abuduna, wa la antum abuduna ma abud, wa la ana abudum ma abudtum, wa la antum abuduna ma abud, lakum dinu kumbal yadin. Before you quote the last word, it's compulsory you should quote the first five verses. We say, Say to those who reject faith. The question of rejecting the faith only comes if you deliver the message of Islam. If you don't deliver the message of Islam, how can you say that he rejects the faith? So first you have to deliver the message of Islam to the best of ability. Then if he does not agree with it, the last resort is Kul ya ayyuhal kafiruna. Say to those who reject faith, I worship not that which you worship. You worship not what I worship. I will not be worshipping that which you want me to worship, nor do you worship which I worship. To use your way to meet mine. Only after saying these four things, these five verses, that after delivering the message of Islam to the best of ability, if he does not agree, tell him, I do not worship what you worship. Not Ram be Khuda and Allah be Khuda. This is hypocrisy. Some of the politicians, Muslim politicians do that. Say, call him by Allah, call him by call him by uh, Ram, everything is fine. Where they get this from, I don't know. They are trying to scratch the back of the Hindus so that they scratch your back. Deliver the truth. And then if they don't accept it, say, I don't agree what you say, neither do you agree what I say. Lakum dinu kumbale din. To you is your way to me is mine. But that does not mean that I should not do dawah. After doing dawah, after delivering the message, the last resort, if he doesn't agree, then say, to you is your way to me is mine. Hope that answers the question. I am uh, Professor Ahmad Basha. My question to Dr. Saab is that uh, Dr. Saab has uh, referred uh, um, 
many things from uh, Vedas and uh, uh, Bible that uh, there, is, there are several prophecies that Prophet Sallallahu the last prophet will come. Very nicely he has explained that. We are thankful to him. My question is, Dr. whether he has discussed these prophecies with the scholars of Vedas and Bible. If he had discussed what was their interpretation for these prophecies. If they have accepted, why they have not accepted Islam? If they deny, on what basis they are denying? Brother, that's the question. That have I discussed all these prophecies with the Hindu scholars and scholars of other religions, faith, and have they accepted? I have discussed, Alhamdulillah, with several. We have discussions in our organization, in platforms, in the temples we go and discuss, Alhamdulillah. And the main concept is, Allah na'bula illallah, <coughs> that we worship none but Allah. Have they accepted? Alhamdulillah, many have. Many have reverted to Islam, many, Alhamdulillah. Several, hundreds, Alhamdulillah. But majority don't. They agree with the truth, but as I mentioned in my talk, that they agree with the truth, but they don't accept it because of ego problem. Everyone has speak about this prophecy, everyone does not. Majority don't, but hundreds have, Alhamdulillah. Hundreds have reverted to Islam. Why don't they accept? Because the moment you talk about this, some give excuse, no, no, these are interpolations put by Muslims afterwards. I said, these verses of the Quran are recited since thousands of years before the Muslims came to India. Where does the question arise of interpolation? They give lame excuses. They agree in their hearts, deep within the heart, what the Quran says is a fact. But they don't accept it. Why? For material gains. If I become Muslim, maybe I will be excommunicated. How will I fail the society? I will go lost in business. So for their own personal reason, they don't accept it. But many do. Majority don't. Why don't they? Allah will not ask me. Allah says in the Holy Quran in Surah Gashiya, chapter 88, verse number 21, He tells the Prophet that your job is to deliver the message. Your job is not to reward the people. Hidayat, Hidayat in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ke hath mein. Giving Hidayat in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your job is to deliver the message. Allah will not question me, why didn't he convert? Why didn't he revert? That's his problem. I delivered the message. Many do, Alhamdulillah. Those who don't do, they will be held responsible on the day of judgment. Why, did, why don't they accept? Because of material gains. If he's a pundit, if he accepts Islam, what about his revenue? Will he get it? No. So we discuss with people, there are people who accept, but majority don't for their own material needs. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. Is it necessary to pass the message of Islam to non-Muslims? Is it duty of all Muslim or a small group? As I mentioned, it is fard for every Muslim to dawah. If they don't do dawah, they will not enter Jannah. It's fard of every Muslim to at least do part-time dawah. But the Quran says in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 104, Let they arise out of you a group of people which enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong. These are the ones to attain felicity. How we are full-time doctors, full-time lawyers, full-time advocates. Why don't we are full-time dies? So there should be a group of people among the Muslims who are full-time dies. And it is the duty of the Ummah to support these dies. But otherwise, it is the duty of every Muslim to at least be part-time dies. They should do dawah. If they don't do dawah, they shall not enter Jannah. It is the belief of the Muslims that all other holy books, Bible, Veda, Zendavis, etc. except the Holy Quran is believed to be imaginary and untrue. But since these books have reference of Prophet, are they true? Please explain. The preaching that I explained in these holy books can be followed. As I mentioned in my talk, all the previous revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were meant only for a particular people and they were meant only for a particular time period. Since it was not meant for eternity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not guard these scriptures from corruption. But the Quran says in Surah Hijr, chapter number 15, verse number 9, that this is the book most honorable and we shall guard it from corruption. Since the Quran is for eternity, till Qiyamah, Allah will guard it from corruption. <clears throat> we believe that Torah is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Zabur is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Injil is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the present Bible is not the Injil which we believe in. The present Bible is a corruption of the word of God, of the word of prophet, of the word of historian, and even there is pornography in the Bible. Partly there is words of God, but totally is not the word of God, because Bible is not the original Injil. 
the Injil has been corrupted since it was time bound. So to know which part of the Bible we can consider as word of God, we have to use the criteria, the Furqan, that is the Holy Quran. Whatever matches with the Quran, we can, we can say this we do not mind as accepting to be the word of God. But that does not mean that the whole book is the word of God. There is no other religious book except the Holy Quran, which is untouched and in the authentic form and is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is it true that all Muslims follow Muhammad peace be upon him, enter heaven on the day of Qiyamah? All Muslims are followers of Islam, then what is the difference between Sunnis and Shia Muslims? Is it necessary to read the Quran in Arabic? The first question, all followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa will enter Jannah? Yes, if they follow his teaching practically, not only verbally. Just by saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you will not go to Jannah. You have to follow his teachings, the Holy Quran and the Sahih Hadith, then you go to Jannah. Otherwise not. All Muslims are followers of Islam, then what is the difference between Shia and Sunni? The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, it says that Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. Double emphasis. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly together and be not divided. What is the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Holy Quran. The Holy Quran is the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We Muslims should hold to the Holy Quran. And the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 159, it says that anyone who makes division, anyone who breaks the religion and makes sex in the religion, his affairs is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will tell him the truth. It is haram to divide the religion. Anyone who makes division in Islam, he is going against the Quran. <clears throat> to ask the Muslim, what are you? He will say, I'm a Hanafi, I'm a Shafi, I'm a Hanbali, I'm a Maliki, I'm a Shia, I'm a Sunni, I'm a Bodhi. What was the beloved Prophet? Was he a Shia? Was he a Sunni? Was he a Hanafi? Was he a Maliki? What was he? He was a Muslim. So if anyone poses the question, what are you? You should say you are a Muslim. The Holy Quran says that Isa a.s. in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 52, he was a Muslim. The Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter number 3 verse number 67 that Abraham alayhi salam, Abraham peace be upon him, was not a Jew or a Christian, he was a Muslim. So if anyone poses the question, what are you, you should say you are a Muslim. The moment you say I'm a Hanafi, I'm a Shafi, I'm a Shia, I'm a Sunni, I'm a Bori, I'm a Aga Khani, I'm a Barevli, I'm a Deobandi, you are going against the teaching of the Holy Quran. It is haram. You may agree with the explanation of Abu Hanifa. With the explanation of Imam Shafi, I've got no objection. You can agree with the explanation. But then anyone poses the question, what are you? You should say, I'm a Muslim. The moment you say anything besides Muslim, you are going against the Quran. Hope that answers the question. Is it necessary to read the Quran in Arabic? You come tomorrow for the lecture, Al-Quran. Should it be read with understanding the answers given there, inshallah. Being a working woman and job and having need to look after parents, my own family, not able to perform five times prayer, Islam being a practical religion, what is the solution for my problem? Holy Quran or the Prophet saying. It is compulsory for every Muslim to offer salah, irrespective of whether he thinks or whether he's traveling. If he's sick, if he can't stand the Quran, says, pray while sitting, pray while lying. In Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 100 to 103. If you can't, if you can't pray while sitting, lying, do with ishara, just with indication. It's fard. Except when a woman is undergoing a menstrual period, she has been given a concession or to offer salah. But if she goes out for any other work, etc., she has to offer salah. There is no work which prevents you from salah. I have been a medical doctor, doctor's life is very busy. I can offer five times salah. These are excuses that people give. Only while traveling, Islam gives you a concession that you can shorten your salah. The four akat salah of Zohar, Asar and Isha, you can cut down to two. And you can join the Zohar and Asar and the Maghrib and Isha. It's a concession. But if you're living in your hometown, you have to offer salah five times a day, minimum five times. It's compulsory, you have no excuse. Irrespective whether you're working or not. Being a Muslim can we wear a tie? Tie is the symbol of Christianity or not? One of the criterias 
of hijab is that you cannot wear dress that which resembles to the unbelievers. I cannot wear a cross. It's a sign of Christianity. I cannot wear om. It's a sign of Hinduism. People say that tie is a sign of Christianity. Don't wear tie. Don't wear shirt. Wear kurta. Don't wear coat. There is a group of people who say this. I am asking, is it mentioned in the Bible, tie, tie is a sign of Christianity? I have read the Bible. Show me which verse of the Bible say tie is a sign of Christianity. There is no verse. Tie is a cultural test. You can follow any culture as long as it doesn't go against the Sharia. The western culture is to wear shorts. The women wear mini. It goes against the Sharia, so you cannot wear shorts and mini. But tie is a cultural dress. It doesn't go against the Sharia. You can adopt any culture which does not go against the Sharia. If you go, if you go in the Antarctic, in the Arctic, the Eskimos, they wear coat. You can't say this is not a Sunnah dress. You can't wear. If you don't wear that, you'll die. People say that you should not wear shirt. See, the kurta that you wear, even that's the sign of cross. You put the sleeves apart, that's the sign of cross. Why do you wear kurta? Why do you wear? Even kurta is, a, kurta is more of a sign of cross. See, you put the sleeves like that. Does it look like a cross? It is. But is it mentioned in the Bible that kurta is a sign of cross? Is it mentioned shirt is a sign of cross? See, there are some Muslims, a group of Muslims, Whatever the Westerners do, they object to it. See, what they do against Islam, you object. Fornication, adultery, you object to that. But what they don't do against the Sharia, unnecessarily don't pick up things. And you'll be shocked to know that the word Kurta is not mentioned in the Holy Quran. The word Kamid is mentioned in the Holy Quran. If you read Surah Yusuf, chapter number 12, no less than five places, verse number 18, verse number 24, verse number 25, verse number 26, it is mentioned about shirt. The Prophet, Yusuf alayhi salam wore a shirt. The kameez is mentioned in the Quran. Word kurta is not there. So if I say I wear the shirt, I am following more of the Quran than you wearing the kurta. See, people get these ideas from where I don't know. Where does the hadith say that you cannot wear a tie? Where does it say? It does say, don't wear thing which resembles that of the unbelievers. Like a chain wearing a cross, putting a varibin on, sign of Hinduism. Don't do that. Thing. Otherwise, any culture which doesn't go in the Sharia, you can follow. <clears throat> the prophecy which you mentioned <clears throat> about a person who will be circumcised, long beard, etc., even refers to Jesus, peace be upon him. That the prophecy I mentioned, that it, I is quoting, I quoted the prophecy of Bhavishya Purana, that this prophecy can refer to Jesus, Christ, peace be upon him. Where does it refer? Are the followers of Jesus Christ keeping a beard? Is it mentioned the Bible keep a beard? It says my follower will be a man who will keep a beard. In all the Muslims, it is mentioned in Sai Bukhari, volume number 7, hadith number 780 and 781, which says it's not a fun. Keeping a beard is not a fun. It's the sunnah of a beloved prophet. It says that do the opposite of what the pagans do. Cut the moustache short and let the beard grow. It's not a fun. It's a sunnah for beloved prophet. It's not a sunnah and the Christians, they don't keep a beard. Being circumcised, it's mentioned, I do agree that Jesus Christ was circumcised. The Christians should be circumcised, but they aren't. Now these are only two points of the prophecy as compared to the 10 to 15 points I mentioned. Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khand 3, Adhita 3, Shlokas 10 to 27. It also says that a Malicha, a foreigner will come and he will be circumcised, he will not have a tail, he will sport a beard, he will not eat the flesh of swine. And because he fights the irreligious people, he will be called as Musalman. Are the Christians called as Musalman? Are the Christians called as Musalman? Do they give the call for Salah? Do they give the Adhan? Who gives the Adhan? The Muslims. But to fulfill the complete prophecy, it refers to no one but a beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. P.A. Abdul Karim, two are planning. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has advised follow the Quran and not to do research on other religious books. Why do we make research and instead convince the non-Muslim the greatness of Islam? In which hadith says the Prophet said don't do research? People quote a hadith in which Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he was reading the Injil and the Prophet said, don't read the Injil. The Prophet said, don't read the Injil for guidance. 
For guidance, you should not read the Injil. But for doing Dawah, you have to read who says that, not Dr. Zakir, Quran says that. Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 111, it says, وَقَالُوا لَيَكْرُوا الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا The Jews and Christians, they say, you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah with your Hajj, with your fasting, with your Salah, with the mark on your forehead. You Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah unless you become a Jew or a Christian. Allah says, تِلْكَ أَمَانِيُّهُمْ This is the wishful thinking. Bakwas hai bakwas. When desires, قُلْ حَاتُ بُحَانَكُمْ Produce your proof. In kuntum sadiqeen, but if you're truthful. And they have produced the proof, the Holy Bible, in no less than 2,000 different languages. They say, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. What do you have to do? Do you have to follow the Bible hook, line and sinker? You have to read the Bible, analyze the Bible and speak to them. Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, Ta'ala ula qalmitin sawa'in, bainan o bainakum. Come to comment terms as between us and you. How will you come to comment terms unless you don't read the religious scriptures? So don't read the religious scriptures of the non-Muslim for guidance, but read it for doing da'wah, and that's what the Quran says, and the Prophet never forbid that. Non-Muslims say that Allah gives risk food to all the people. It means we don't have to work. We will get everything freely, like manna salwa for son for his bride. What is the answer for this? Nowhere does the Quran say that you don't have to work. Quran says he is the Razak. He is the Rab. He will give you sustenance. But nowhere does the Quran say that you should not work. A beloved prophet said, trust in God, but tie a camel. That does not mean you leave the house open and then say, no robber will come. You have to follow the Quran. Try your level best. Do not be dishonest. You have to be honest. Do not cheat. Do not be corrupt. In spite of that, if you feel that you earn less, don't be bothered. Allah is the one to give risk. With all your intelligence, if Allah does not want to give you risk, does not want to give food, with all your intelligence you cannot earn a single pie. So Allah says, follow the guidance of the Holy Quran, He will give you risk. But that does not mean Allah says, don't work. Allah says, that you have to do righteous deeds. You should work in the right way. Don't be corrupt. Is it said that 1,24,000 prophets came to this world, to guide the destiny of mankind. Only 25 names of Prophet have been stated in the Quran. I want to know from you why the names of other Prophets are not mentioned. I mentioned in the talk that the Quran mentions 25 Prophet by name. If all the 1,24,000 like names are to be mentioned and the stories, it will require a big encyclopedia. We Muslims don't have time to read this book. This Holy Quran is so small. It takes few hours, we don't have time to read this. Who will read that encyclopedia? See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has related the story of those prophets which is good as an example for you. Some may not be an example for you. The Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 164 and Surah Ghafir chapter number 40 verse number 78 We relate to you the story of some and of the others we don't. Those which are useful for you for guidance, Allah relates the story. It's not necessary here to relate the full history of mankind from Adam to today. You will require a big tall skyscraper like Empire State Building to give the history of all the prophets. So whatever is important for you for guidance is given in the Holy Quran and the Sahih Hadith. As we are Muslim, we believe in that the Holy Quran is the message of Allah. There is no doubt, okay? Uh, but non-Muslim uh, non brothers, they doesn't believe the Holy Quran is the word of Allah. They need some proof, some evidence. What is the evidence we can give unto them? The so brother asks the question that how can you prove to the non-Muslim that Holy Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That calls for a big lecture, brother. I doubt to the people and the mood to listen to that. There is a video cassette available of mine. It is the Quran God, but I think it will be available outside. Those who want can acquire it. I don't know what the hadiah is. Is the Quran the word of God? It's a two part, part one, part two. And I've proved there scientifically that Quran is the word of God. I've proved to an atheist, to an Hindu, to an Christian that Quran is the word of God. For the complete answer, you can refer to my video because it is the Quran the word of God. I have dealt with the various types of people. Every individual requires a different style of argument. You can take that video because it and view it. Inshallah, you'll get the answer. This is my small question. Uh, I'm, uh, elders say that uh, touching the feet of uh, 
uh, elders, that is, uh, the, who are elder in our age, touching their feet is a good thing. Touching the feet of elders is a uh, custom in Hindus, we say. Brother asked a question. The Hindu friends say that touching the feet of the elders is a custom. Is it allowed or not? Is it allowed or not? See, as I said, you cannot bow down to anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot bow down to anyone. The Quran says that next to worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being kind to your parents. In Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, we have to respect our parents. But you cannot touch their feet, that, that means you are worshipping them. You cannot worship anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because your parents have given you birth. They have let you come physically in this world. But the main person who gives you risk, etc. is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is your creator. He is your sustainer. So if you have to thank anyone, you have to thank only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to ask a Hindu friend, who is greater? God Almighty or your parents? They have to ask them, who is greater? God Almighty. So if God Almighty is greater, you have to only worship God Almighty and no one else. You can respect them, you can obey them, alhamdulillah, but not worship them. Touching their feet and bowing to them means you are worshipping them, which is haram, which is shirk. Christians are said to perform miracles by the help of Jesus Christ. Is it true? How is it happened? And my second question is about the health of Mr. Ahmad Dida. The question posed is that the Christian friends say, you can do miracles with the help of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. How do you answer them? See, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 24, verse number 24. It says, For there shall arise many false Christs and false prophets, and they shall do wonders and miracles, and if it's possible, shall deceive the very elect. That means Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Miracle is not the test. Doing miracle is not the test at all. For judging that you are a follower of Jesus Christ or not, peace be upon him, miracle is not the test. I do know there are miracle healing ceremony where people come in public, there are thousands of people and the priest comes and says, the lame person starts walking, the blind person starts seeing, all these are fake, these are gimmicks. We have got video cassettes showing that the person who comes on the stage, he is planted by them only. He is planted by them. It's a fake. If miracle, if they can actually heal the people, I tell them, I am a doctor, why don't you come to the hospital and heal the patient? 100% will convert to Christianity. 100%. Why are you going out in the public? Come to the hospital and treat the patient. 100% will accept Christianity. They say, no, no. Why? Because they are fake people. And Jesus Christ, peace be on said in the Gospel, that when people will come to Him, that, oh Lord and Master, we did wonders and miracles in your name. Jesus Christ, peace be upon will tell them that, ye, ye men of iniquity, you depart from here. I don't even know you. Jesus Christ will tell these people who do miracles, I don't even know you. Miracle is not the test. Miracle is not the test. If you say they do miracles, you are the Christian person to come to Bombay, and I know thousands of patients who are ill, all thousands will convert, 100%. Ask them to heal them. This is just making a mockery. And this mockery is there in most of the religions. You find in other religions also. So miracle is not the test. But if you want to argue with them, you have to quote them as mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, that if you have faith, you can do miracles. The people who believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. They can do miracles, they can speak foreign language, and no poison can harm them. So you have to tell them, yes, potassium cyanide. Have it. If you say you can do miracles, according to the Bible, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, no poison can harm you. Give them potassium cyanide and let's see whether they have it or not. That's the test, according to the Bible. Hope that answers the question. Non-Muslim friends ask me, you go to Mecca and do tawaf round the stone. The same thing also we do to our deity. How to explain to non-Muslim friends? Very good question. That some non-Muslims say, that you Muslims, you all are the biggest idol worshipper. The stone which is worship maximum in the world is the Kaaba. How do you reply to them? And they say that all the Muslims, when you pray, you bow to the Kaaba. We have to tell them that no Muslims bow down to the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Qibla, it's the direction. We Muslims, we believe in unity. When we have to offer Salah, we have to face in one direction. Suppose we have to offer Salah here. Some may say, let's face east. Some may say, let's pray towards the west, some may say north, some may say south. There will be a confusion. 
for unanimous decision, for unity, all the Muslims in the world, they face towards the Kaaba. If they are in the south, they face the north. If they are in the east, they face the west. If they are in the west, they face the east. Kaaba is the Qibla. No Muslim worships the Kaaba. We face towards the Kaaba for unity, for unification. When we go for Hajj, we do the Tawaf around the Kaaba. We do the Tawaf around the Kaaba, we circumambulate because every circle has got one center indicating that we believe in one God Almighty. We believe in Tawheed, we believe in unity. We do the Tawaf to again testify that there is one God Almighty. Every circle has got one center, it doesn't have two center. Regarding do we worship the Kaaba? Hazrat Umar may Allah be pleased with himself that I am kissing the black stone not because it can benefit me neither can it harm me just because the prophet kissed I am kissing it otherwise this black stone it's a lifeless thing it cannot harm me neither can it benefit me no Muslim worships the Sangha's world no Muslim worships the Kaaba and the best argument is to the Hindus that at times of the prophet the Muslims even stood on the Kaaba and gave the Azan I want to ask which Hindu will stand on the statue of his God will they stand? no the thing you worship will not stand on it so but naturally this is enough proof that Muslims don't worship the Kaaba hope that answers the question how to make Christians understand that Isa is not son of God what are the proof we can give for this matter what you have to say is there is no unequivocal statement in the whole Bible where Jesus Christ peace be upon him himself says he is God or worship me if any Christian can show me any unequivocal statement anywhere in the Bible where Jesus Christ himself says he is God or where he says worship me I am ready to accept Christianity just now I am not speaking on behalf of the other Muslims I am putting my head on the guillotine there is not a single unequivocal statement in the whole Bible where Jesus Christ peace be upon him himself says that he is God in fact he said it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, My father is greater than I. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, My father is greater than all. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, it says, I cast out dullness by the finger of God. He never claimed divinity. Regarding Son of God, Bible has got sons by the tons. David is the son of God. Isaac is the son of God. Anyone who follows the teaching of God, they are children of God. But they say, no, no, no. Jesus Christ is not a plain son. He is the begotten son of God. And they quote, Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, we say, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever shall believe in, believe in him, shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Do you know this word begotten? from the latest revised standard edition of the Bible, RSV. It has been removed as an interpolation, revised by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different corporate denominations. The revised standard version goes closer to the authentic source of the Bible. And they say that this word begotten is an interpolation. It should not be there in the Bible. It's a fabrication. So nowhere did Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, claim divinity. In fact, he said, my father is greater than I. My father is greater than all. I can of my own self do nothing. He never claimed divinity.